tonight's Facebook Live town hall. Tonight, we will be diving into the subject of relief and help for renters and homeowners during the COVID-19 crisis. And I am so pleased to be joined tonight by three terrific panelists. We have Congressman Alan Lowenthal. Thank you so much for being here. We're also joined by Lisa Sitkin from the National Housing Law Project and Anya Lawler from the Western Center for Law and Poverty. As you know, California has taken truly extraordinary steps to fight COVID-19. And together we are meeting this crisis. Together we are beginning to bend the curve. We do know that California's statewide stay-at-home order is working. We also know that our statewide stay-at-home order has been a tremendous sacrifice for so many Californians. And I'm sure congressmen like your office, each and every day, we get phone calls from constituents who say, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills, don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage. I'm scared right now. So I'm so pleased that we're able to answer some of your questions tonight. And uh, we've got some questions that came in over email. We'll start with those, and then we'll also be responding to questions that come in on Facebook. I'll just say that if we don't get to your question on uh, the live segment, my office will cycle back with you either through email, if that's how you reached out, or through Facebook Messenger. So um, with that, I, I'm going to start with a question that, like I said, we get almost every day, and that's, I can't pay my bills. I'm afraid my house is going to get repossessed. What is the government doing to help me right now? And Congressman, if it's okay, I'd like to, to start with you on that. If you could share with us the federal perspective on, on this issue and uh, all the work that you're doing to, to help homeowners during this time. Okay, let, let me give you a little history and where we are right now, Connie. And first I wanna thank you uh, for inviting me to be on the town hall. Um, uh, I know this is because every day, as you point out, all of us, we all have our constituents wondering how are they going to pay their bills? How are they going to keep their housing? Uh, what about their jobs? Uh, and this is a, a crisis of unbelievable uh, size. Uh, the Congress is started. We've now done, well, at, after this week, we're going to finish up. We're going to get we will now have dealt with four major bills. The first bill was a, the beginning of March, and that was a bill to try to get as much money as we could to the uh, healthcare facilities, to start the testing, to find out what was the scope of the problem. Then we did a bill to, um, to protect families. And we said, you gotta be able to have, um, uh, 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 leave, you have to be able to have family leave. Um, there has to be a way in which we can support families. And then about two weeks ago, we did a massive bill, which said, all right, everybody is now tremendously impacted by the virus. We're laying off people. We're going to first provide uh, a tremendous additional help and extend unemployment tremendously. We're going to say that we're going to expand who is eligible for unemployment, in the past, it was very rigid requirements. Now we're gonna do things. Single people who have entrepreneurs, uh, gig economy folks, part-time folks. We're gonna to try to get everybody in. We're gonna extend the amount of time that unemployment is there. And we're gonna give everybody, in addition to what your state gives you when you apply, because that's a state, we're gonna give you $600 a week. Well, there are so many people applying for unemployment because that keeps you whole a little bit. If you, that the systems have been collapsing and EDD is having a hard time in here in our state and in all states trying to deal with the massive numbers. But hang in there. If you're not getting benefits or call our office or, or, or even your office for the state, you know, to find out what is happening. The other thing is we're trying to protect, uh, we're, we're trying to get rid of the virus. That's the first thing. So we're trying to support uh, wonderful Governor Newsom, who has really taken a tremendously positive stand and said, we're all in this together. We're going to do something. We do not want to become another New York. We're going to drive this down. We're going to do whatever we can to stay at home and to, and to protect the most vulnerable. And we're going to make sure that everybody does that. And I'm real proud of it because I spend all my time, all, every day, 
either talking on, on the Orange County call with the health providers, I'm dealing with Leader Pelosi, I'm dealing with uh, when we're here again, interactions with Mnuchin. Do we have enough money? And the next the thing that we did on the original bill, besides the unemployment, was a massive increase in uh, small businesses, and those were businesses up to 500 people. We also helped larger businesses, but to small business especially. And we said that um, if you keep your employees on the payroll, we'll pay for it. We'll help you tremendously if you keep them. We'll give you a loan, but we'll forgive that loan if you keep those employees on the payroll and the money goes directly for paycheck protection. Um, we're finding that as we're going to, because we, that money went out the door, it was the most popular federal program in the history of federal programs. Money, people were applying, and unfortunately, it did not get as much as we wanted to to the small businesses in our community, to the nonprofits, to the people who may not have had the resources as some of these larger small businesses. Very important, but we realized as the money went out, we have to protect some of the smaller businesses. And we also realized we gave a tremendous amount of money to hospitals, but we're just learning that we have to be able to move our money quicker and more effectively to the hot, to the real hot spots, and that's what we're going to try to do. And so, so that's where we are now. We're going to give additional money to small businesses for the PPP, but we're going to take money out. It's starting this week, about sixty billion of the three hundred billion or so that we're giving to the, and we're going to say that is just for small businesses, just for the businesses that go through their local credit unions and community banks and. We've got to support women-owned businesses that deal with CDFI, community development, financial institutions. So we're going to try to get the money to the smaller banks because we realized we didn't get that money the first time there. And so that's kind of where we are. We know we didn't deal with cities. We tried as hard as we could to, to deal with it. We're working on a letter right now. We led a letter to Treasury asking Mnuchin to say, you know, like, Counties like like Orange County, which have uh, given a great deal of resources to uh, trying to get the homeless off the streets with Operation, I think it's it's uh, um, key, uh, turnkey or key. To, key. We want to okay. yeah, turn, we want to make sure that's an, that, that those cities and the counties that do things like that get reimbursed right now. Because right now, with you out, county today received its money from. We think about what's an allowable expense, and so we're working at that. So there are two issues: one is getting the money there, and then figuring out getting the guidance out because all of this is brand new. And so that's where we are right now. And I, I'm thank you for, being, for asking me that bill, which adds tremendously to the small business, to uh, hospitals, to testing. Uh, that will be to the governor by the end of this week. Well, thank you so much for that overview, and thank you Not for right. your to the president by the end of this week. Yes, and thank you for your leadership in what is, like you said, a truly unprecedented crisis. And you, here in California, totally. we're doing everything that we can to provide relief for the families, the workers, and the small businesses who have been so devastated uh, by this by this global pandemic. Um, and specifically in terms of the relief that we've been able to provide for homeowners. Here in California, uh, we secured agreement with four of the big banks, Wells Fargo, uh, Citigroup, U.S. Bank, and J.P. Morgan Chase, as well as 200 other small lenders to provide a mortgage relief for a 90-day period to help California homeowners through this period. Um, Lisa, can I uh, ask you to provide us with some of the details of that program and just an overview? Absolutely. Um, I'm actually going to step back just for a moment, though, because I want to lay the ground and say that we have that state program, but I sort of view it as um, an extra layer after um, the federal protections that were provided in the CARES Act, which was signed on March 27th. So specifically for homeowners, I think that's sort of the starting place to know about, and then I'll just talk about the, the state piece as well. Um, the CARES Act, in a nutshell, um, for what are called federally backed mortgage loans, which is about 70% of all loans nationally, 
Um, these are loans that are backed or insured or guaranteed by a government agency, and that includes Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. People may have heard of those. Um, they sort of got famous during the foreclosure crisis, and they're back in the news. Um, in any case, if, if your loan is in that category, then the federal act um, gives you the right to contact your mortgage servicer. You always have the right to contact them, but to request um, mortgage forbearance, which I will define in a moment, um, for uh, a total of up to 12 months, but it will very likely be in smaller increments before then. And we're, we're seeing that the most likely increment, especially when you first call, is going to be 90 days, and then you can get that extended as you need. And nobody knows exactly how long this is all lasting. Um, so that that is provided and under that federal law and again for the federally backed mortgages um, in order to get that assistance you do need to contact your servicer none of it is automatic but um, all you need to provide is your affirmation that you are having a financial hardship due to the covid pandemic um, and that can be directly or indirectly it doesn't mean you have to be have been diagnosed or something, it's that you are being impacted financially and are gonna struggle to make that next payment. Um, you are not supposed to be required to provide any documentation because at a time like this, uh, it's very hard for the servicers to process that and very difficult for many people who may not have a fax machine or other technology at home to be transmitting documents. So that was provided for there. So that's, that's the kind of first layer. Now, for people who don't have that protection in that other 30%, which are privately um, held loans, um, we do have this agreement that um, Governor Newsom's administration um, was able to make with several banks, including a number of state chartered banks. And I provided, I think this will be shared, um, a link to where on the Department of Business Oversight website you can see which institutions are participating in that. There are details about it. That works a little bit differently. Um, it provided for up to 90 days of forbearance, and I just emphasize up to because you're not guaranteed the 90 days. So if you're getting less than that, it may be because that's just the fine print there, but hopefully people will generally be getting at least three months to give that cushion. Um, and then uh, in that instance, in the agreement, there may be some additional documentation required. We're hoping that's not being asked for a lot, but there is a little bit more wiggle room on that for, for those. So if you don't have a federally backed mortgage, and again, I've provided materials here and a link so you can look that up um, if you don't know, uh, you may have, you may hear some different messages or something from, from your mortgage servicer. But the important thing is that what people should be getting and should be offered when they call to request help or when they go to the website of their servicer is this thing called a forbearance, which is essentially a pause in your payments. So um, they say, okay, for this three months, if you can make partial payments, that's great because then you won't build up so much of a, of a, a amount due at the end. But if you can't, then it will be down to zero and you will be able to, to um, delay making those payments. It's very important to know though, that these are not being forgiven, they're not being waived. So if you get one of these forbearances, then there's gonna be a further process at the back end when that ends to work out how those monies are gonna be repaid. And there is, I will just be honest about it, a fair amount of confusion about what that's gonna look like because nothing right now is clearly mandatory. There are a lot of complicated moving pieces. We are hoping to move toward a more consistent, clear um, kind of model for, for what that will look like at the back end. But the important thing for people to know is if you can pay your mortgage, even if it's a bit of a stretch, it's much better to do that. This is really, I consider sort of a last resort. A lot of people need it. A lot of people need this help, but um, it's important to know that it's still complicated to get and complicated to resolve afterwards. So don't take it lightly. That's okay. And so, so just some of the key points for folks then is that it's not automatic. You need to work with your lender to to make this happen. 
Um, but there is not proof or documentation required as long as you're, if you're a Fannie or Freddie customer. Uh, there may be for the other folks. Um, it's a forbearance, not a forgiveness. And um, so how, how do people figure out then um, what, what the terms of the repayment are once the forbearance ends? So uh, that's sort of the $50 million question because there are a number of um, approaches, arrangements that can be made. But because the servicers um, don't know right now what your financial situation is going to be at the end of the forbearance, some people may be right back on their feet, able to resume payments. That'll be one kind of plan. Um, other people will not be able to return to where they were financially. So for them, they will need to be reviewed for a full loan modification in the hopes of getting that payment lowered. For people who can afford it at that time, they will be offered the option of simply reinstating, meaning paying a lump sum. That's not gonna be most people. And um, I think one of the concerns people have is a lot of the services are saying on these calls, well, you're gonna have to pay it back right at the end. Um, there's a slight risk, they're gonna ask for that, but if you can't afford to do that, they should be working with you at that point to work out a plan such as extending your loan terms so that you start making your payments again and then just make up those lot those missed payments um, later at the end of your loan term um, and there are you know subtleties to how that can look but it is going to depend on what's affordable for you and um, what your circumstances are at the end of the forbearance okay and we've got a few follow-up questions uh, let's see uh, how long will the temporary payment relief last. Um, Congressman, can I ask you to feel that uh, one? Well, as was pointed out, uh, in the original CARES Act, it had that the forbearance would last for 100 and up to 180 days with an extension of an additional 180 days. So we're really talking about it this, as this goes on. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be up to one year, about just about one year it was considered. That's how long the forbearance. And remember, it's not just Fannie Mae or, or Freddie Mac. It's, you, it's, the, uh, federal, it's the Federal Housing Administration. It's the Veterans Administ Affairs. It's the Department of Agriculture. There are a large number of federal agencies that either own or, or back these loans, many of your mm -hmm. loans that are out there. And so you need to check with your bank whether whether you're eligible for it, because the forbearance is longer, uh, and was, and it's correct. The CARES Act did not specify at all how it would be paid back, with the under the thought that that would be worked out, just like in the state, that would be worked out between the lender and the individual, uh, and there's lots of thoughts and differences between different lenders about how to do that, and hopefully that will get resolved uh, as more guidance comes down. Right. And um, so, you know, we did get a question of how do I figure out if I'm eligible for help, which I think, Congressman, you, you, you did answer, but just I want to make sure that people understand that you know, the first step in all of this is to contact your lender to understand what uh, you're eligible for, to discuss the terms and to, to get an arrangement in place and to, if, if at all possible, to do that before you miss a payment. So you know, do that. Do that now. Um, can I just add? I'm yes, sorry. please. Um, the etiquette of this is always I would interrupt, but uh, I just want to add that, um, as I mentioned, there are some tools where you can, before you contact your, your lender, look up. If you're not sure if you have a federally backed loan and you want right. to know that going into the phone call, which I think is useful to arm yourself with the information, there are ways to check that in your mortgage documents or for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, there's an online tool for that. And in the, in the materials and links that are provided, there's one from my organization, NHLP, um, that that has a little sort of chart of how you find that out. So I would say it's very important to reach out to your servicer, but you may want to take a little time first to just um, educate yourself about what kind of loan you have and what kind of category it's in there. Okay, all right. So now someone said, I, my bank told me that they're not offering this assistance. What other resources are available for me and people like me? 
which is for me. Yes. You're waiting. Okay, go on, mind you. No, if you'd like to say. Yeah, Congressman. No, no, no I'll wait. Just mind <laughs> for, I think all banks, if you have a really, if you have a federally backed or operated, you will get your money if that's there, that you will be able to go through the federal process. Uh, you have to find that out, as was pointed out, and it's so wise to find out before you contact your lender that you have. But your lender, if it's really owned and operated and or been sold to the federal agency or their, their manage, you will be eligible for it. Uh, and only, and, and it's a very simple process, extremely simple. You just have to state that you've been impacted by this and demonstrate you've lost your job or something like that, you somehow have a crime, and that it's federally backed, and that's it. And um, uh, I would add, yes, please. I would just add, I'm sorry, in terms of you know where else to go, unfortunately, I mean, if you don't have a federally backed loan and your servicer is saying this assistance is not offered, um, I would I would say that it's important to push back a little bit because even in, for non federally backed loans, um, most servicers are providing some kind of assistance, and even if they're not doing a three month or a six month or something, they may do at least one month, and then you can call back and get it extended. So, I would push back and explore what's possible and whether they would review you for some kind of other option, even a loan modification. Um, depending on kind of what your finances are, but um, maybe don't take no as your last answer. Okay. So as you said, do some research up front so you know what you're eligible for going into the conversation and uh, be willing to push back and uh, don't take no. Do not take no for an answer the first time. Uh, another question is, is this going to affect my credit report? And the answer to that is that the forbearance may be listed on your credit report, but that does not damage your credit score. What does damage your credit score is missing a payment. And that's why it's so important to reach out to your lender before you miss a payment. Um, I don't know if there's anything either of you would add uh, to, to that. Uh, I would just say that the CARES Act has a section on credit reporting that actually w it, some of the experts, and I'm not one on credit reporting, but are a little bit confused because it seems to actually say that they're supposed to suspend reporting. So it may show up as some sort of forbearance, but it may actually just show up as nothing at that point. And, um, you know, so don't don't be shocked if that's what you see. But the idea is that if you get a forbearance, it should not impact your credit score. Yeah, I, let me give the exact language that I am, because you're absolutely right. In, in, if you are getting forbearance, and especially on a federal loan, a back loan, federally managed loan, um, the CARES Act amends the Fair Credit Reporting Act, in, and it instructs lenders to report that borrowers are current on their current, on their credit obligations, when a special payment accommodation like a forbearance, if you're given a forbearance, is in place specific to the COVID-19, and that's how you get the forbearance. You have to say that this was due to COVID. That the, the law, the FET law states that you are to be reported as current on, on your obligation. Mm -hmm. And the governor also has said the same thing. He has also asked that, that there be no negative credit reporting for those participating with lenders in California with, for the non-federally backed. So it, it's, it, it, it doesn't have all the specifics laid out about it, but the intention of the CARES Act was, this is not to be a negative, uh, uh, to, to affect your credit rating. Absolutely, if you get forbearance, that's, you are now to be listed as current. Yes, 100%. And uh, so will, will, will I be charged extra fees or other charges if I accept this temporary relief? Uh, my understanding is no. Correct. Your lender is not supposed to charge you any fees for uh, allowing you to participate in this program or offering you this relief. Again, when we're talking about the federally backed loan, so it's going to look a little bit different. If you find that you do not have one of those, you should be asking specifically about that on the call. Our hope is that servicers will be waiving any fees they might otherwise have charged but there's not a requirement and that they, you know, don't do that unless it's federally backed. So that's why that distinction matters for people to know. Right. And um, just 
One other question um, for, for you, Lisa. Can my bank foreclose on me and evict me from my house during this emergency? So currently, um, under the CARES Act, again, there is a moratorium on foreclosures that expires on May 17th. It was a, basically a 60-day from mid-March. We are hoping and expecting, given how things are going, that that will be extended. I don't know if the congressman has any insights on whether we can expect that. Um, but uh, again, that only applies to those federally backed loans. So there are people currently not covered by that. Um, under the agreement that um, the governor struck with um, several of the big banks and many state chartered banks, there also is an agreement to hold off for 60 days. And I think that that was in late March as well. So we're looking into May. Um, but I, I just want to emphasize that it's not, there's not a complete consistent across the board moratorium on foreclosures. It's a mostly moratorium right now. And right now it's temporary. Um, there is some activity in, uh, in the legislature here in California to try to get a stronger and more comprehensive um, protection for people, and hopefully that will start to move forward when the, the legislature comes back next month. Yes, I absolutely anticipate that it will. And Congressman, uh, if you have any insight on what might be coming on the federal side, if you'd like to? Yeah, I, I, think, I think what we can see is that the premise is to protect homeowners and keep them in their homes as they go through, as they lose their revenues, as they lose their jobs, as they're now having to seek out. And I think just as we've seen with the SBA loans, which we, we, what, what will happen will not be less protection for homeowners, but we'll look to see if we really are covering everything that we say we are. And so I do not anticipate when we extend this program that we're going to lessen the protections of forbearance or, or uh, not having any, you know, any evictions or loss of home. That we're not going to do. But we're going to take a look and see uh, how it's working. As I pointed out with the small business loans, we've now realized that we are not some of the larger banks are giving, as they normally do, are going to the customers, their larger customers, and giving out those loans. And the small customers, the mom and pop, have to wait at the end of the line. Well, we've got to deal with that. And that's what we're trying to fix by having more money go to community banks, community, and that limit uh, uh, the amount of money that the companies have to, to apply to keep it in those communities. And, that, and the same thing will happen here. We're going to look to see as we go to the next stage, how do we make sure we protect those that have been affected by the coronavirus? That's all we're trying to do is to protect our communities. This state, they had nothing to do with this. Uh, and we're making large demands upon them to stay at home. It's the responsibility of the government in, during these times to help them do that. And that's what we're going to do with the next one also. Well, and Congressman, I know I think you've got another. Get to the snags. If we say we're sending them a check, get that check too. Right, you gotta, you gotta get it to them. Um, I think you, I, I believe you've got another engagement. But yes. before you, before you sign off, um, I want to ask you one last question because Congressman, you have been serving our community for 28 years in local, state, and federal office. Uh, you spent 14 years in the California State Legislature, including uh, during 2008, the Great Recession. I would just love, before you sign off, to get your kind of big picture perspective on the lessons that you learned as a policymaker during those times and you know, what you see as California's really critical priorities as we weather this crisis and uh, move on to ensure a, a swift recovery. Well, even before I, taught, I, I was in elected office, or while I was on the city council over 20 years ago, to 35, 40, I taught community psychology at California State University, Long Beach. So my whole orientation is listening to my community, understanding how we can prevent problems, uh, that psychology has much more of a role in terms of prevention. Well, 30, 40 years ago, that was not seen as, you know, we waited to treat people and to have people come to us. And I think what we're seeing is now the first thing is that we have to be far more prepared 
and de deal a lot more and put our money into prevention. That's what we, we have to protect our small businesses. Uh, we have to protect the people who are on the front lines, the community health centers, because they're the ones that are the most vulnerable. They're the ones that are out there helping people who may not have insurance, who need to have help, who are the, in the communities that have the highest incidence. Uh, and so, and we must, and, and, and we, did, we have to deal with homelessness issues. We have to deal with housing issues, not just keeping people in their homes, but getting people into their homes. We have to make sure that we do that because that will help us prevent things. That will help us with all kinds of illness. That will promote well-being in communities. And I think California's done a great job. It was great when I was in the city council, when I walked my district and People kept telling me as a college professor, why are you doing this? And I'd say, well, this is why I do it. They'd say, well, that's really interesting, Alan. But tell me, what's this black soot in my window? And that's when I began to learn about pollution from the ports, uh, people having to breathe that area that we really have to prevent uh, and make sure that all communities have access to resources and, and we don't disproportionately affect communities. So I'm, I still think that it's like when you're running for office. I think that's the best thing you can do. It's not being in the, it's walking and talking to people. It's listening to them. Uh, I, I think staying in touch and understanding, it's all about being a partner with them and protecting them. And you're just, you're just part of that process along the way. And so it, it's, it's, it's been kind of my life's work and I'm very, very pleased that I've had it this little opportunity to participate and hopefully help my community do better. Well, thank you for joining us and thank you for all that you do for your community and for all of us. Thank you. Look forward to catching up with you soon. All right, thank and, you. And we're now gonna transition over to, we, we spent uh, the first part of the conversation focused on uh, relief for homeowners and talking through the, the programs that are, are going to help uh, with mortgage relief. We want to move now to some questions that are focused on renters and what we're doing to help and protect renters. So Anya Lawler, I'd like to, to start with you on this. Uh, I lost my job because of the shutdown. Now I can't afford to pay my rent. I'm scared I'm going to get evicted. <laughs> so um I'm going to talk about a variety of different rules that are in place around evictions, um, starting with the rule that applies broadly statewide and then touch on some federal rules and some local rules that might be of interest to some of your constituents. So the most um, sweeping rule in place in California is the rule that was adopted by the Judicial Council. Um, that applies to all 58 superior courts in California that effectively puts a pause on all evictions in California until 90 days after Governor Newsom lifts the state of emergency related to COVID-19. Um, we don't know when that will be yet, um, but in all likelihood, um, that's probably not gonna be anytime soon, uh, which means evictions are on pause until at least the fall, if not beyond that. Um, and that rule applies to all evictions. So not just evictions related to non-payment of rent, but any type of eviction um, is on pause right now, other than evictions that are necessary to protect public health and safety. It was very important um, that the courts were able to, to move those types of evictions forward. Um, but all evictions are on pause. And what that means is that landlords can start the initial stages of an eviction. So for instance, if you can't afford to pay your rent, your landlord could still give you what's called a three-day notice to pay rent or quit. And if you can't pay the rent, which a lot of people are probably not gonna be able to do, um, and that notice fires after three days, they can file an eviction. But that's where it stops. Um, and the courts will not move any further on that until 90 days after the state of emergency is lifted. And um, so tenants don't have to respond in any way at that point. That will all be handled later down the line. Um, so that's, that's kind of what's going on statewide. Uh, I will note, though, that once a landlord gives a tenant a three-day notice to pay rent or quit, and that notice expires, um, the landlord is at that point under no obligation to accept back rent from the tenant at any point. Um, that, that obligation is gone. 
Um, now, hopefully a lot of landlords are going to be willing to work with their tenants. We imagine many will, but that's just something for people to be aware of that it's possible that if your landlord does choose to file an eviction now, come the expiration of that judicial counsel order, even if you have the money to pay the rent, you may still be impacted by an eviction unless those rules change between now and then. And I think that's something on the minds of the legislature right now. Um, in addition to that judicial counsel rule, um, there are federal rules in place. Um, so it gets a little confusing. So tenants in some types of properties are protected by even stronger federal rules that prevent a landlord from even taking that first step to file eviction paperwork. And those rules are in place until July 25th. And those are applicable to tenants who live in uh, public housing properties, properties financed through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, which is going to be most types of deed restricted affordable housing. Um, it also applies to tenants who live in properties that have a federally backed mortgage. So a mortgage backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, the VA, things like that. Um, now, how are you supposed to know <laughs> if this applies to you? It can be a little challenging. You probably know if you live in public housing. I think you probably know if you live in deed restricted affordable housing and it's likely if that's the case that it was funded through low income housing tax credits, but we can give you a link to a website to verify that. Okay, great. And then in terms, yeah, that, everyone. in terms of properties with federally backed mortgages, that's roughly going to be about 40 to 50% of single family properties in California and probably about half of multifamily properties. Um, the 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 your you should ask your landlord to check with their servicer because the they they are uh, the servicer is obligated to let the landlord know who is actually backing that mortgage and so the landlord can then let you know if your property is covered and there are national groups working on trying to build a database of those types of properties but that's a bit of a work in progress so it can be a little bit challenging but ask your landlord your landlord may already know and if not they can try to find out to to, to know whether you're protected by the federal protections. In addition, many, many local governments throughout California have adopted their own local eviction protections. And in uh, Assembly District 74, uh, Laguna Beach and Costa Mesa have both already adopted local ordinances. And these go a little bit further than, than the court rule and, and, and things like that, because they actually say that um, for, well, just with respect to evictions related to non-payment of rent where the tenant has lost income or had some other financial impact related to COVID, um, if the tenant notifies the landlord within 30 days that of the rent being due, so 30 days after the rent was due, if you notify your landlord that you couldn't pay the rent for that reason and you provide documentation, and it's, it, it doesn't specify the type of documentation, just any documentation that would show that you've lost income, lost your job, had reduced hours, um, had medical expenses, things like that, and you provide that to your landlord, at that point, the landlord cannot proceed with an eviction. Um, and you also get 120 days after the emergency is lifted to pay the back rent. Um, so it can be a little confusing because what protections you have currently depend on where you live. Um, and so what I would suggest is if you, you know, number one, if you cannot, if you, you should pay your rent if you can. That is the best way to protect yourself. Just as Lisa said in the, in the mortgage context, the best thing you can possibly do if you can is to pay. Um, this isn't intended as you know a free for all for everyone to simply stop paying their rent, but we know that many people are not going to be able to pay their rent and we know that that can create a hardship for some landlords. And so um, if you can't, the best thing to do is communicate with your landlord as soon as you can retain all of the, the communications and start gathering any evidence you might have to prove that you are impacted by COVID. And um, so one question, what about evictions that were already happening before these new rules? And um, you know, my understanding there is that evictions that were already in the court system may in fact proceed, but by virtue of where we are with the, the state of emergency and the judicial counsel, uh, their, their new rules, that has effectively paused any evictions that were in process as well. Is that accurate? Yes. Uh, 
with a couple of caveats. So if a, if a, an eviction case had already been set for trial, or even if the tenant had received the summons and responded to the summons and it was in process, those evictions will eventually move forward, but not for at least 60 days. So those are all pushed back at least 60 days, and then we'll see what happens next. Um, and then also, uh, it's not going to get to the, the, the point of the sheriff's lockout, which is the last point in an eviction if the, if the, you know, the landlord gets the writ of possession. And so those are, those are on pause right now as well. So um, those will eventually proceed, but right now people should be confident that they're gonna be, remain housed even if they already had an eviction in process. Yeah, and I think that last point is really what I want people to take away because I think that um, you know sometimes as we do as lawmakers, we end up with, with these very these things that are very complicated. And it's kind of the you know if or buts or you know all these little sub uh, these little subsets. But the goal with all of this policy is to ensure that as we move through this crisis, that people are protected and that no one ends up uh, on the streets over the course of, uh, of this global pandemic. And that is the absolute goal. And I think that there certainly is more work to do on this and there's more work that um, we will be doing on this from the legislature's perspective. Uh, just one of the, the things that, that I wanna flag for folks listening is that, that I and um, a group of legislators are working on uh, the creation of a renter's relief fund. Um, so working on legislation and a budget request to support that. Because, uh, as we said, at the, the end of, of this kind of reprieve, there's going to be a lot of people who have really large rent bills and in many cases aren't going to be able to pay them. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to provide as much relief as we can uh, for people who have been impacted by this. Um, let me see. So a couple more questions that, I, uh, that are coming in I'd love to ask you to field. So I'm a small business owner. Am I protected too? Yes. So the Judicial Council emergency rules cover those types of evictions as well. So same same rules, right? Uh, 90 days after the state of emergency is lifted is when courts can start reprocessing evictions. Um, and so until that time, everyone, whether you own a small business or you're a renter, you can be confident that you're going to be able to stay where you are. And I got one question about timing. So is there any discussion among the legislature and the governor to extend the eviction pause order past May 31st? And I actually want to respond to that because the, the, uh, the current rule says that uh, there's this pause on evictions 90 days beyond when the governor lifts the emergency order. So uh, if that if the emergency order was lifted tomorrow, we would still have an additional 90 days. So it's, it's not expiring on May 31st is what I want people right. to Right, and I think where that stems from is that the governor passed an executive order that expired on May 31st, but then the, the Judicial Council acted after that, and their actions effectively overrode that executive order and gave much more time. Yes, it gave more time and it gave more protections, yes. Uh, so let's see, what should I do if my landlord threatens to evict me despite all these rules? So uh, I just want to highlight the point that the assemblywoman just made, which is that uh, your landlord cannot evict you right now because the courts are unable to process those cases and the sheriff is unable to lock you out. Um, and so just be confident that even if your landlord is threatening you, they can't do anything. And what we would recommend in those cases is if you feel like your landlord is threatening you, um, contact an attorney and get legal assistance. Um, don't let yourself be coerced into signing anything. It's fine if you want to approach your landlord and negotiate an agreement on back rent, on a rent reduction, things like that. But we would strongly recommend that if you're going to do that, that you get legal assistance to make sure that you're not signing anything that might sign away rights that you don't know you have or that might override relief that might be coming from the legislature or the federal government. Um, but just be confident that there is nothing your landlord can actually do right now. And, and if your landlord does lock you out during this time, know that they do not have the right to do that. And that is a crime and you should contact your police. Now, hope, hopefully nobody will do that, but you should just be aware and, and just feel confident that for quite a bit of time, you cannot lose your housing. And I think the, the, the good thing is I think the vast majority of, of landlords and the folks that I talk to are trying really, really hard to do the right thing and do the right thing by their tenants. Um, and they're also finding themselves in a really tough 
tough spot where they've got a mortgage to pay and tenants that perhaps can't afford to pay their rent. So I did actually want to, to jump to some questions that we've gotten from landlords. And Lisa, I'm going to start with you. So who's, who's helping the landlords is, is the question. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I think that um, there are a combination, a, a series of kind of policy proposals and things being considered now um, to try to address that. Some may look like um, the rental assistance relief um, that the assemblywoman was just speaking about at the state level, but there is um, another round of federal legislation um, being considered and discussed and chewed over right now uh, that also includes um, a significant amount of funding, um, some of which might go uh, directly to tenants, but some of which would go actually to um, support, for example, low-income housing tax credit owners uh, in buildings where their revenues from the rent have, have gone way down um, to be able to stabilize those. Because those are properties where we've already invested public dollars and we want to be sure they can operate and everything can keep going to have that affordable housing still exist for the long run. Um, so there is attention being paid, but right now I can't point to a specific landlord relief fund that that is yet um, in existence, but um, stay tuned. But I, I think it's important that landlords understand that they do qualify for all of the mortgage relief programs that we, sure. we talked about at the, at the beginning of our conversation. Sure. If you have a mortgage, you, you can certainly contact your servicer and everything. And, um, you know, and then there's going to be that question, as Anya was talking about, with the accrued rent later of, you know, your accrued payments then. And we want to make sure as much as we can that those things line up so that when the, the landlord has to go back to paying their mortgage, they're getting some income from the tenant or from the government or somewhere to make that possible. And if, if applying for, a for, for this forbearance, will banks and lenders assess your application differently if one application is for a home property and one is for my rental property? So under the CARES Act, um, for those federally backed loans, um, there is not a distinction being made at this time. So you should be able to get the assistance. And I know of one former client of mine who has gotten forbearances on both her home loan where, for the home where she lives and a rental property um, uh, where she also has a mortgage and, and the forbearances um, were applied in both cases. Okay, right, so both your primary residence and, uh, and any investment property that you rent out are, are all eligible for those mortgage relief programs that we yes. talked about. Yes. At the top. Um, okay, one of my tenants has the COVID-19 virus. Am I now obligated to warn others at my building? Um, Anya, can I ask you to feel that? Uh, I can take a crack at it. Okay. Uh, and, and I would just say that landlords should not be disclosing medical information about any of their tenants. Okay, yes, and um, you're under no obligation to, to do so. And in fact, there's, uh, there's privacy laws and guidelines that, that prohibit sharing medical information with, with the rest of your tenants. Um, I have a renter now. I'm thinking about selling my house. If I sell my house during this emergency period, is that breaking the law? Lisa, can I ask you to field that one? Sure. Uh, so I don't think it's breaking the law to sell your house. I mean, there are obviously practical impediments to doing home sales now, although I understand some are going on and there are virtual tours and things happening. Um, but if you have a tenant uh, and you anticipate, you know, trying to have them leave or the new owner is going to try to have them leave, there would be an issue with trying to displace them at that at this time, given the rules that are in place. So, um, you know, certainly if you want to sell the house with an existing tenant in it and the new owner is going to continue the tenancy, that should be fine. Um, but if you're looking to displace someone, I think that that can be a problem okay 
So if you, when you sell the house during this period, the, it has to be done with the existing tenancy agreement as part of that sale. It does. And I will say, and Anya knows this better than I probably, but there are also before COVID and everything that we're going through now, there were certain protections in place for tenants and houses that were sold anyway. So that's something as a landlord, you need to get your arms around <laughs> um, at this transitional moment if you're going to sell to understand what is and is not allowed, not just under crisis conditions, but under the law generally. Uh, okay. Anya, is there any, anything you would add to to that? Uh, no, I think Lisa covered it very well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other, the last question I have uh, on the Facebook is, are there any financial assistance programs that I can tell my residents about? I've got a bunch of tenants that have been laid off and are telling me they can't, they can't pay their rent. Um, and so I just wanted to, to touch on a few of the, the programs that are available to help to help everyone during this navigate this this really uh, incredible crisis, and um, the congressman mentioned some of this because some of it is part of the, the relief that was provided by the CARES Act. But um, as part of the CARES Act, we have extended unemployment insurance benefits in a couple of ways. So we've increased unemployment insurance by six hundred dollars per week. Uh, for all filers. We've also, under the pandemic assistance uh, program, we have uh, been able to extend unemployment benefits to non-traditional workers, so big workers and Uber drivers, uh, part-time workers, uh, self-employed folks, contractors, are now eligible to receive unemployment benefits. And that program is going to be rolled out and available on April the 28th. So is that yeah, six days from now. Um, and while it's going to be available on April 28th, those benefits, you can, you can uh, apply them retroactively. So you can apply those benefits as far back as February 1st if you have uh, a job loss and it's related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, other, the other thing I would highlight is that California has paid family leave programs that are available that people should should be aware of. And uh, we also have food assistance programs. Uh, and to find out more about that, you can look up CalFresh. So you Google CalFresh, and that's the best way to, to find out that information. Um, the income thresholds to receive CalFresh, which is California's food assistance program, are it's about $2,000 a month for uh, a single person and uh, around $4,300 a month for a family of four. Um, so. There are a number of programs that, that are available to help uh, all of our constituents and our communities make it through this very difficult period. Um, there are also a number of short-term rental assistance programs that I wanted to, to flag for folks, and then I'd love you to, to add, um, add on anything that I may have missed. So the Salvation Army offers special one-time assistance to help pay your rent. Uh, Catholic, Catholic Charities has emergency assistant grants that can help pay rent as well. And uh, Modest Needs is a program that provides a one-time self-sufficiency grant of $1,000 to cover an emergency expense. Um, and the, uh, I guess the last resource I want to make sure that people have, because I feel like when we, when we go through these town halls, we get so much incredible good information from the experts that we're able to, to bring. But it's always very clear to me that these programs can be really tough to navigate and sometimes just really overwhelming the amount of, of information that, that uh, gets thrown at people. So if you are struggling to pay your rent, if you want us to help connect you with resources in the community, that is why I'm here. That is why my team is here. So please do not hesitate to call all of our office. My office number is 949-251-0074. And we can help you navigate uh, the rental and mortgage programs that, that we described tonight, and we can help connect you with resources and help during this time. Um, I would love for, uh, for both of you just to share any, any resources or, or other things that, that you want to make sure people have before we, uh, before we wrap up to tonight's town hall. Anya? Um, 
I am happy to share some resources with your office um, that they might not already have that can help connect uh, tenants with uh, information and resources and potential legal assistance if they qualify. Um, and I'll just say again that, you know, please pay your rent if you can, but if you can't, be assured that you're not going to get evicted anytime soon. And we know that, you know, a lot of people are very worried because they know they're never going to be able to make up that back rent, but that's going to be a high priority issue. I know, as the member said, when the legislature comes back in May, and it's also a very high priority issue at the federal level. And so we do anticipate that things will change um, and some relief will come for both tenants and landlords to ensure that, um, you know, all of that back rent owed doesn't sink both tenants and landlords at the same time, which isn't going to be good for anybody. So appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to your constituents today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and I would just say thank you for having me, first of all. Um, I, I think it's great that um, there's so much outreach and, and effort to, to provide information to folks. Um, I did provide your office with a few resources specifically for homeowners. And I just wanted to reiterate that um, the first one on that list, I don't know if it'll come up that way when you distribute it, but um, is for my organization, National Housing Law Project, um, NHLP.org. We have a whole bunch of COVID resources. A lot of it is geared toward tenant advocates. Tenants are well, themselves are welcome to come there and look. Homeowners, there is a section for them, and I have provided a link to that summary of some of more details of um, the programs that we talked about. Uh, and also, as I said, um, a way to sort of a little toolbox for how you can look up um, what type of loan you have, which, which matters um, given what, what the lay of the land is right now. Thank you. Well, thank you both for being here. And um, I did wanna just touch on, on, on one subject that my office has been getting a number of phone calls and emails about, which is a uh, bill that's being discussed, AB 828. And um, I will just share that I, I, I am not a supporter of this bill as it's currently drafted. I think we need to make sure that uh, as we work to provide relief for renters here in California, which we are uh, absolutely committed to doing, that we ensure that we do not create a uh, unintended consequence and an unfair burden on landlords, which um, then puts them in an equally, if not worse, position. So um, that is why, uh, instead of, of a framework that uh, AB 28 is proposing, I'm working on a uh, rent, the creation of a renter's relief fund that would be supported by state budget funding. And uh, that, that is the way that I believe we, we need to provide relief for, for renters and also support for landlords to ensure that we get through this crisis. And uh, we will, uh, we can and we will get through this crisis together. Uh, be safe, stay home, and stay strong. Thank you so much. Look forward to uh, catching up with you next week. Thank you. Thank you.